um, as an economy. And when outside forces came in, African Union did not do anything. That was sad. An African leader was taken on the streets and killed. What are you going to do as African Union to get some teeth in the defense processes of the continent? That's the first question. I'm glad you, uh, you asked that question. And uh, if the truth be told, the African Union was not pleased with the manner in which the UN Security Council voted to take out Saddam in the manner that they did. The African Union had a plan. Zuma, President Zuma of South Africa, had already accepted him for asylum. Plans were in, underway to talk to Gaddafi for him to move to South Africa. So yes, the decision to take out Gaddafi went against the wishes of the African Union. We wished things had been handled a little differently. You're quite right. I think, uh, but when you're coming up against more powerful forces, again, it goes back to Africa taking its rightful place on the world stage. But AU was clearly opposed to the manner in which Gaddafi was taken out without a plan for replacement, which is what led us to the, the Libya that we have today. My second question, black racism on white. I've seen farms being taken over by Mugabe forces, uh, the ZANU PF people. What is the African Union doing to, when we talk about racism from Africa and we bash colonists and we actually are doing that to their citizens right there, what are you going to do to recompensate and rehabilitate those citizens who have been there for four generations, five generations? What is African Union going to do for that? Okay. I like the fact that you're putting a timeline there. See, with history, we have a tendency to say, well, let's start the story from here moving forward. But let's not talk about the story going back. In Zimbabwe, you have to say, how did we get there? Let me take one minute and summarize it for you. When the British came to Zimbabwe, they analyzed the country and divided it into four regions. Region one was the best soil, the best rains, best conditions for, for farming. Region two, pretty close to region one. Region three, uh, there were some areas there, the soil was not so good, and the rain was good, but not the best. Region four, no rain. The soil was horrible. Mosquitoes and scissor flies. So they set out a plan. If you were an adventurous British, a veteran of the First or Second World War, you were guaranteed 2,000 hectares. Hectares, multiply 2,000 by 2.2. You were guaranteed that much in Zimbabwe, plus any loot from the local people. So a British man would land in Zimbabwe. So based on the regions that they had decided, they were going to move all the black people, preferably from the region 1 and 2 to region 4. So the process started. And how did a British map up their land? You got on a horse, they'll tell you this region. Get on a horse and you ride in one direction for a day until either you or your horse were tired. You put your peg. Tomorrow morning you do the same thing. So it took four days for the Englishman to map up his land. At the end of the four days, everything in it is yours. And the people who, were, who lived on that land were told in this direction, go past this mountain, in this direction, go past this river. They left with whatever they could carry. The chickens, the goats, the cows, they were theirs. And some of them were not so lucky. You barely settled again when another Englishman came and he was given that part. And there you were again. Slowly the process of moving black people to the west parts of the country started and it was finally completed in the 50s. Now, you want to ask me who needs to be compensated? Are you with me? Yes. So we got to go to the beginning rather than understanding things superficially. How did you get your hand? It just goes about how fast you could go. Some of these farmers were owning five, six, seven uh, uh, farms. I know my 
family farm. And I grew up hearing the story from my own father. When the situation took place in the case of my father, he remembers distinctly, he was a, a teenager. And uh, he, he used to, you know, when uh, white men came to Africa with their pants, they called them men without knees. He remembers men without knees coming to the village on horses. There was some hush-hush talk. He didn't know what was going on. But he remembers waking up one morning and the whole village was on fire. They were being torched by these men without knees on horses. His aunt was pregnant and was due any day. So they had asked for permission for her to stay until she delivers. It was one little hut that was left standing in a bent out village. They left with whatever they could carry. Sadly for them, Aunt didn't deliver for three weeks. My father spoke about how scared he was every morning. The man without knees coming to check and see if my aunt had delivered. There was him, an uncle, another uh, grandmother who was a midwife, and, uh, and another aunt. They all crumbled up in this one room. When she finally de delivered, three days after delivery, they were told to walk, go find the others who had left before. Now the loot law, it was in the, it's in the history books. You don't have to go far. It's in the British history books. They, as a matter of fact, the British started fighting themselves over how to distribute the loot as they go from one place, one village to the other. It was acceptable. So son, do you still want to ask me who is owed what? May I rest my case? Thank you. You're welcome. But those people still have families. We need to be compassionate. Uh, thank you. Uh, those people still have families too. I do have families. And when I go home and they're still in Region 4, I got a problem with that. Uh, thank you. Uh, just 2010. And what I noticed is that the Chinese did wonderful um, uh, infrastructure projects in Kenya uh, that really helped revitalize um, the streets, et cetera. However, I also noticed that many Kenyans are also very qualified to do the same type of jobs, such as engineering, construction work, et cetera, but we're just unemployed. So I'm wondering, what is the African Union doing to maybe like a policy change uh, for the continent, where you do have the Chinese coming in and doing infrastructure projects, but they're also employing the youth. Because you see the, uh, uh, in Kenya, for example, the youth is very educated, but they're unemployed. So if you're unemployed, you'll get involved in things that are not good for the society that we all frown upon. So what can the African Union, Union do to, yes, bring the Chinese in or whoever, the Western, um, from France, from Britain, but also employ the people, the youth in particular. Your point is well taken. And like I mentioned earlier, we are actually seeing uh, uh, a, a change in the attitude. Mm -hmm. Now Chinese companies are being made to hire the locals because that has been a problem. Um, I'm not sure why it took so long to begin to do the pullback, but now, yes, absolutely, they are required to hire local uh, locals and also train locals. But at the same time, I go back to say, even we as diaspora, rather than sit here in America and other parts of the world and shoot out complaints, there's a role that we can play. But because we are not coming together as Africans, individually, we are groups of people who are sending, I think formally, anywhere from 50 to $60 billion into Africa. Informally, estimates say of $100 billion. And yet, we can't come together. If we were to come together and get that money into Africa in an organized way, Africa does not even need the aid. We can change our own circumstances. So at some point, while we are trying to figure out what we need to do, we must first and foremost own what we need to own and take responsibility for that which we can do uh, for ourselves. So for that one, my sister, I'll take it back to you to say rather than complain about the Chinese, what have you done? for Africa. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for coming to speak to us today. And my question deals with the Nile River. And more specifically, I'd be interested to know 
what your stance is, and then collectively what the AU stance is on the conflict between Egypt and Ethiopia over the Nile, and to what degree are, is the African Union concerned when General Sisi says that he's willing to utilize the Egyptian military to further Egyptian interests over the Nile? You know, it's one of those situations that you say to yourself, again, back to common sense, with especially those two countries. What about solar? It's all about power. And the two countries are fighting over water. What about power, solar? There's no need for that. So there's been something terrible to say, we build solar plants that will provide the amount of power that Ethiopia needs and the amount of power that Egypt needs. Let's let the rivers be. Because there are options. Because otherwise, that's a war you can't win. There won't be any winners there. It's a loss, loss for Ethiopia. It's a loss, loss for Egypt. So the option is solar. And I have that, I've heard that conversation as a way of addressing the issue between the two countries. Thank you. Next. Hello, my name is Ken Pokuta, representing KP Empire and Chris Consulting. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting uh, her Excellency at the African Growth Initiative, the Brooking event, and I was very uh, inspired by her response to my question. Uh, I want to thank both of you guys for being here. Um, so my question is, uh, in respect to the quote you mentioned in the very beginning, uh, you're not African because you're born in Africa, rather you're African because Africa is born in you. And uh, as a young African, uh, born here in the U.S., I am truly proud and blessed to be able to trace my roots directly uh, through my parents, uh, in, sp in particular, Congo Brazzaville. Uh, so my question is, how can I start awakening some people, some, some of my fellow peer Africans who can trace the roots to Africa but are truly confused because of slavery or colonialism and don't have the privilege of visiting Africa, having African relatives and such. Now I take it your, uh, your parents are continental Africans? Yes. Now you have a very special situation. You are like my children. I used to apologize to my children all the time to say, when you are at home, you are in Africa. Because I'm raising my children the only way that I know how, which is how my parents raised me. But when you step foot outside Africa, you are in America. So every day, you're having to make that journey and that transition. And I'm sure you know some of you young ones when you get together and you start talking about the dumb things your parents do, the dumb things your aunts do, and how they can't speak English. Um, <laughs> but we are raising you the only way we know how. So for you to have made that journey and uh, uh, successfully ended up the way you are, we say thank you and congratulations. The issues of uh, African diaspora, as you may be aware, the African Union recognizes that for true sustainable change to come to Africa, it's going to need to involve the African diaspora. And the African diaspora by African Union definition is all people of African descent living outside Africa. That means those who were forcibly brought here in chains and those who came here later in search of greener pastures. But be it as it may, we're calling on the Africans to come together. That's why I'm here. The quandary for most heads of states is, while we want the African diaspora to look back home, how do we go about it? It goes back again to the divisions among us. So it is really just imperative that we begin to work together as the African uh, diaspora, a united African diaspora, just like the Jews do. You can walk into a uh, Jewish embassy, I'm told, uh, before age 18 and say, I'm a Jew, I want to go home. You get a round trip ticket home. That's what people do when they believe in themselves. 
because we don't expect you kids to know Africa by osmosis, by bumping into me. We have to put together a plan as Africans to say, game is over. Something has got to give. How do we expect our children? And believe me, I'm doing my part to bring us together. So I'm counting on you to join us. Thank you. Thank start you, right? by visiting your, your Africa house on 1640 Wisconsin Avenue. A number of African Union uh, member states that have shown intent to leave the International Criminal Court because of a perceived bias against African war criminals when compared to war criminals from elsewhere. What do you, I mean, every individual to stand trial in the ICC has been African. What is your comment on that? And what is your comment on um, the fact that a lot of AU member states wish to leave the ICC? Well, I think they do need to leave the ICC uh, because there is a bias. Africa needs to have its own criminal court, and that is in the works. It is that simple. Is that simple? It is that simple. What Why hasn't there any been anyone from Myanmar indicted by the ICC? Absolutely. It's, it's kind of strange that only but Africans get indicted. Instead of leaving the ICC, shouldn't the Africans, obviously they voice their concerns, but shouldn't they work towards a better ICC where more individuals from not more individuals, but <laughs> you know what I mean, where individuals who are indicted aren't only African, because there are plenty of war criminals who walk free. Africa needs to have its own ICC. Africa must take care of itself. Simple. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Ambassador, Mr. Cohen. And also thank you for everybody for being here and asking great questions. Um, I think you are, would have made a great lawyer because when you make your case, it's almost irrefutable. Well, one of the things that you do is you use stories very well. Stories are important because they give context. They tell you about the history. They tell you about your failures, your successes. More importantly, they inspire you. As Africans, I don't think we've done a good job telling our stories. Uh, I grew up in Lagos, Nigeria. And I read Oliver Twist, Pride and Prejudice. Um, didn't learn much about, you know, Nkrumah or the great African leaders that came before my time. And I had to search myself. I mean, everybody here has probably seen a movie about uh, the Holocaust or, um, you know, the Alamo. But there hasn't been a real movie about what you just described that happened in Zimbabwe. So how can the world put context around what is going on in Africa? How can we inspire the youth in Africa to think that it's possible to overcome the challenges? I'm not asking for us to hide those things. That's part of our story now. Um, why can't, like, more importantly, in more concrete sense, what is the African Union doing in terms of educational policies to try to shift this a little bit so that African youths can actually learn about their heritage, their story at a very young age to inspire change that we really need to come in the future. I think you made a very important point that Africa has got to take charge of its own narrative. We must tell our own story. I like to call it the they syndrome. Um, again, goes back to Berlin Conference, 1885. We are waiting for them to do this. We are waiting for them to do. Who is they? Who is them? Our colonized mind is the white man. What's stopping us from telling our own stories? Things are happening around us. We are waiting for somebody to tell this story. That we must own. So we must tell our own stories, we must tell our own narrative, what I've done in my own power here at the AU Mission in Washington, D.C. We've now set up an internet television and radio. We hope that we will be telling the truth about Africa from there. So if you want to hear the truth, just tune in and we'll tell you the truth. So you don't have to now begin to say, oh, what did BBC say? What did CNN say? Because we don't tell our own narrative. 